That was a huge change in the world when that happened. And everybody knows how much the internet changed the world. Yes, it did. But when I saw what Chat GPT could do, I felt like I was witnessing one of those types of changes. So we want to use AI in order to shape people's opinions and mm -hmm. beliefs, uh, outlooks on life. Hey, my name is Martin McLean. I'm here along with Paul Price. And this is Uncensored Pilgrims. We're coming to you again today on another podcast episode. Today we're going to talk about Chat GPT. Now, Chat GPT, what does that stand for, Paul? I actually just asked Chat GPT to tell me what it stood for, and it said that it stands for Generative Pre Trained Transformer. Yeah, I'd go by Chat GPT. G Chat GPT. Yeah, I think that's, you know, somebody called I call it Chad. Chad. Okay, hey, Chad. Chad. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's amazing how much technology has advanced in my lifespan. Uh, I was actually born in 1966. 66 was a very good year. For okay. births. Cause, For births, because yes. you were there. there. There you go. 1966. Seems like a long time ago. I think 1985 was a good year 85, for births. 85, yes. That must be, that was the year after I graduated high school. And that was the year... Of your that, birth. Of my first birth. Your appearing. My appearing. Your appearing. On you, the world stage. You, the, the, you, <laughs> you, you came through the birth canal at that point. <laughs> All right. Uh, but here, here's the deal. When I was growing up... We didn't have computers when I was when I was a child, but you know I can remember the first video game we got was the the Pong. It was just yeah. the, the one. It was a gray screen almost with the white ball that would go, yes. and it's kind of like a soccer type situation. You try not let them score the goal, and you hit it with yeah. that little tiny dash. Uh -huh. like. But then we had something called a speak and spell. Oh, I love those. You just hold it. You know, spell cat K A T. That is wrong. Try again. C A T. That is correct. Now I'll try it. Then it give you another word. Uh, and, and then this was really high tech. Okay, we had to have something that would give us answers. We didn't have. We did not have the internet. We did not have Chat GPT. But I had a, a good friend of mine. His name, his name was Greg, and uh, we were buddies growing up. And and he had a magic eight ball. Oh. Have you ever seen one of those? Oh, yeah. You hold them in your hand, and and you ask that magic eight ball questions, and then you'd shake it up. We'd, we'd be in his room and. And, you know, you're like 12, 13, 14 years old, and uh, you couldn't go anywhere because you didn't have a car, and your mom and dad had to take you everywhere. And we didn't have, like I said, didn't have internet, didn't have cell phones, you just had the landline. And so you'd be thinking about, you know, seeing if a girl would go out with you. Now, back then, that meant meeting them at the movies or your mom and daddy taking you out to McDonald's or something. You know, it's kind of like that. That's how it was in that day. And so you didn't want to call anybody and get turned down. And so what we'd do, we'd get that magic eight ball, and we'd start shaking it and say, if I asked so-and-so, would they go out with me? And they'd say, no way. And you can just shake it again and say, no. And then you had to shake it several times to get the answer you wanted. Do you remember how many choices it had? Like how many sides were on that on that little polygon? I don't polygon? know, but it would, it would float in the water, you know. And so it was say, like, yes, yes no, no, maybe. A ask or, me again, yeah, you maybe, know. something like that. But we'd shake it till we got the answer. Yeah. You know. <laughs> then we would, we'd probably never make the call anyway. Yeah. Uh, but but anyway, that's kind of what we you know that's how I tell you you know you'd ask the, the magic eight ball. Now don't get a magic eight ball. I don't you don't need to get involved with magic. It's not you don't need to do that kind of stuff. But you know I was a, a young impressionable. I mean cover. a magic eight ball is is essentially no different from rolling a die or flipping right, a coin. Right. But what I'm saying so, is that we had we did we couldn't ask Chat GPT questions. We could yeah. not we could not do anything like that. We had. Speak and Spell, Magic 8-Ball. Uh, but we did advance to a video game system called Intellivision. Oh, yeah. the now, uh, Yeah. It was called George Plimpton. He was a writer and sports guy and famous personality. He was like the big spokesperson for it. Um, it was called Intelligent Television. And it was, you know, we actually looked down on people that had Ataris. Oh, yeah. I mean, because, you know, the graphics kind of would shake, you know, and all that kind of yeah. stuff. It's kind of low-rent stuff. But, yeah. But, you know, we had an Intellivision. But we now the like, Intellivision, is that the one where you had to put little uh, colored uh, colored pieces of film over your over your TV no, screen? No, 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 no. To, to, to no. add color to the game? Or no, I, no. What no, I actually had? I ColecoVision, maybe. Maybe ColecoVision. I don't Intellivision, know. Intellivision, like, if you, had, if you played football... Say you wanted. Or to, no, I'm thinking of Magnavox Odyssey. Oh yeah, well, no, no. This is in television. Okay. Now, it, like this is how it was. If you wanted to 
say run a pass play, uh-huh. you'd have it'd be a four digit play you'd have to call. Nine uh-huh. for pass, three for formation, one for receiver, and the fourth digit would be where you wanted them to catch the ball. Okay. So you know that was intelligent intelligent television. It was kind of you know you're at the top of the food chain then, but now. We got this chat GPT. This is how far it, it has come. You, you go from in television, Atari, even the Nintendo, you know, gaming systems, and you've got to be able to play other people online. And now you have a presence online that almost seems like real. Tell me a little bit about the chat GPT. Well, I, I'm new to this because this came as a shock to me. I only learned about it maybe a few weeks back. I want to say, okay. honestly, is is how long. So hasn't been a whole lot of time. But I, I was born in 1985, like I said. And I haven't seen as much change in my life as you've seen in yours. Probably the biggest change I had seen in my life was, and it happened when I was very young, so... You know, it was more one of those things where when you're that young, you, you kind of just accept things rather than being surprised by them, right. so to speak. So, right. you know, for me, that would probably have been the invention of the Internet. Thank you, Al Gore. Thank you, Al Gore. Uh, you know, as I was growing up, I remember the first website I went to was the Toy Story, AOL keyword, Toy Story on uh, AOL. Wow. With a dial-up modem. Probably it was uh, 9600 baud. So it wasn't even a 56K modem. And I can remember, you know, having just seen Toy Story, and then you could get on AOL and go to their keyword for Toy Story, whatever that keyword was. And I remember just watching that web page load. It took it like five minutes I to load. those days. Yeah. It just went down like a little bit at a yeah. time because it was downloading those pictures, and yeah. it took quite a while. But that was awesome. But you know, that was that was a huge change in the world when that happened. And everybody yeah. knows how much the internet changed the world. Yes, it did. But when I saw what Chat GPT could do, I felt like I was witnessing one of those types of changes. Yeah. Like the invention of the internet. Yeah. I felt like I was somebody if you had taken somebody from, you know, nineteen hundred Right. Who had never even seen anything electric uh, electric before, and then you showed them your uh, Pong console. Yeah, they would. What talk. would they do? They would think it was some type of magic. Yeah. You know, for somebody from 1900 to see Pong mm-hmm. would be crazy to them. Yeah. And that's the feeling that I got when I first saw what Chat GPT can do. Mm-hmm. And it just felt like it came out of nowhere because. It seemed like this was being developed under our noses without people being aware of how far along it had become. Right. You, do, you didn't realize it was able to do what it could do until all of a sudden they said, look at this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because before that, you know, I, I'm sure you've been to these websites like UPS or, or different co- companies have websites and, the, and it'll, it'll pop up with a little chat bot in the corner sometimes like, yeah. oh, I'm the UPS assistant. How can I help you today? Yeah. And, you know, when you answer it, it just gives you basically very, very scripted, pre, pre-written pre responses and only a few possible responses like, I can't help you with that or... It doesn't think for itself. It doesn't, it yeah, does it doesn't. It's programmed. It just has a few basic little responses. And that's all I had ever really seen. And so when Chat GPT popped onto the scene, all of a sudden, I'm seeing things happen that seem like magic. Right. And um, so I spent quite a while interacting with it and trying to understand what it could do. And, you know, obviously a lot of people have not gotten access to it yet. So it's one of those things where I feel like you almost have to see it to believe it. Because I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it for myself. And you showed it to me today. And it actually did a little bit of a sermon. Yeah. And then it did it in in the um, pirate yeah, I asked it to write Language. a sermon, and then and it could do that no problem. And then asked it to write it as a pirate, and it could do that. No and it problem. ended its sermon with yo ho ho and a bottle of rum or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So obviously yeah. it was not a a Baptist. It was pirate. probably a uh, Presbyterian. <laughs> it's probably an Episcopalian. I'm sorry, an Episcopalian pirate. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it's well known that Chat GPT can do these kind of little tricks, like talk like a DJ or talk like a pirate, or, but. 
I think what's a little bit more creepy is the way that it can talk like actual people from history. And, uh, you know, I was showing Marty a little bit of that, too, you know. You know, I had it write up a little story about Adrian Rogers giving a a sermon, who Marty has mentioned in previous episodes was with his favorite pastor. And it's just kind of astonishing how, uh, you know, convincing it can be at this stuff. You even had Adrian Rogers and Andy Stanley write a poem together. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 That's that's not ready for publication yet. That's, no. that's pre-publication draft. <laughs> but... Um, the point is, this this technology is able to do things that just seemed like magic only a few weeks ago before yeah. I saw it. Yeah. And uh, so I think what everybody's realizing when they see this is that this is definitely going to change the world. But, <laughs> you know, the first reaction I had to this was not really necessarily a positive one because I just started to realize how dangerous technology like this is going to be for this for this world for the society we live in we already have so many issues with people being dependent on technology people being dependent on the internet but does this, it make you lazy or does it make you smarter i think it makes you a little bit of both okay. if you took the average person the average educated person today with access to the internet, they probably have a smattering of knowledge that might be greater than what the average person, you know, several decades ago right. might have had because we're inundated with information every right. moment of the day now. Yes. Uh, but critical thinking ability, that's a different story. That, that is key. That You're is right. a very different story. But, um, you know... The first thought that I had is just knowing that people are going to become even more dependent than ever on technology. Because yeah. what this is, just so you guys know where this is headed, okay? Chat GPT, and I only learned this recently, but apparently it, the company that made it, OpenAI, was originally started by Elon Musk, of all people. Okay. But his idea behind starting it was not really what it has become today. Yeah, he kind of warns of the dangers. That are yeah, ahead. he's warning of the dangers now. You know, the, the the word open, it was supposed to be open source, meaning, you know, not for profit. Everybody can see it. Everybody can share on it. But it is it is not open source. It's closed source now. And it is for profit. And it's being funded by Microsoft. By, it's being manipulated by, in, a, in a progressive well, yeah. direction. So we'll, we'll get there because Bill Gates is funding this. Now, you, what can yeah. that possibly mean, right? So Bill Gates is funding this. Microsoft is funding this. And it was obviously under tight lock and key until just recently when it popped up. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that it is a uh, massive business leap forward for Microsoft. Right. And, and it's they actually caught Google on the back foot, unaware of what they were doing. Google's been working on this stuff themselves as well. They got one called Bard. Bard, yeah. But they've been re reluctant to bring it out into the spotlight for some reasons that I think we're going to get into. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but Microsoft decided, you know what? We're, we're going to be the first. We're going to beat Google to the punch. We're going to add this to our Bing search browser. Yeah. And so what you see when you go to chat GPT, what you're actually interacting with is like a beta version because it's um, not live. Do they have the alpha version? Um, actually, they do, and that's called, uh, well, I don't know if it's alpha, but there's another version called GPT-3 that I also messed around with a little bit. But um, So the point is, uh, this represents uh, kind of an attack by Microsoft against Google because they're, they're beating Google to the punch. Okay. And Google was forced to scramble and put together a press conference to try to compete with Microsoft, and they stumbled and they fumbled. And mm -hmm. in one moment, they lost $100 billion of stock value over that fumbled press conference. It's about the uh, uh, Webb telescope, right? Uh, yeah, that was the, it the made a, it made a, a it, it, that was one of the issues with their conference is that it made a, a factual error. Factual error. Error that um, is, and it really embarrassed them, and and it yes. hurt their stock price. Because I could be on the internet and answer that question. 
Yeah, yeah. The web, the web, the Hubble, or one of the, the the telescope thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the point is, this was this is kind of like a tectonic shift in the world of of technology business type of thing because we're looking at, you know, who would have thought Google could be put could get put on the back foot like this? Oh, yeah. But um, seems like that's what's happening right now. Um, but the fact that they're incorporating this extremely powerful AI right. into the Bing search browser and they're adding a chat feature to the search browser. Now, the difference is the the chat GPT that I was that I was just showing Marty, this is not live connected to the internet. It can't look up a website for you. You know, it was trained over a series of years and the and the cutoff date was 2021. So chat GPT doesn't know anything past the year 2021. And, and it's part of what's called the large language model? Yes. Right. Yes. And so... Uh, they, they, by the way, they, they pour billions of words into them every... Uh, billions of words of everyday text. Yeah. Are yeah. gathered from ranging so sources from books to tweets to everything in between. Exactly. Uh, but the, the, the cutoff training date for chat GPT specifically was 2021. Okay. But the new version that they're adding into Bing is live, which is different. Wow. It's it's connected to the internet live. Real time. Real time. So so I can say uh, what did Aaron Rodgers learn in his darkness retreat? Uh yeah, Adrian Rodgers? No. Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers, no relation. The no football relation. Player. He went the in, football. Player. I want to know what a darkness retreat is. Well, uh, can you ask Chat GPT what a darkness retreat is? Because Aaron Rodgers took one, and I've just been curious. What do you do on a darkness retreat? Yeah. It's very, uh, very I, intriguing. I don't know. Um, what, okay, what does GPT say? It says it's a type of meditation practice where a person spends several days, typically between seven to twenty-one days, in complete darkness. Often in specially designed room or chamber, my word. The darkness retreat is meant to provide a sensory deprived environment, so on and so forth. We got like four or five paragraphs. Man, here. Hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. Um, I don't know if I would. I don't know if I want to do that. Yeah, because this question that you asked here is not something that happened. It doesn't require live connection to the internet to answer that question. Okay, right? just so obviously in 2021, people knew what a darkness. Yeah, retreat, yeah, yeah. Even though we don't know what a darkness retreat yeah, is. Yeah, but to sit in the dark. But here, here's here's where it gets really problematic because what this means, this is able to answer your question. It first of all, it's able to understand human language just like another human right. pretty much would. So you don't have to formulate your question in so some special what way. What you could do is you could say, write me a poem about a darkness retreat. Okay, we just found out what a darkness retreat is. Aaron Rodgers, twilight of his career. Packers don't like him anymore. Who's going to get him? In the depth of the night, in a chamber devoid of light, a seeker ventures deep within to explore the hidden realms within. Wow. Keep going, man. I want some more. Uh, darkness engulfs the senses, but the heart opens up to its defenses. The mind slows down its chatter as the soul seeks its own matter. Ooh. Man, I feel like I should just snap my fingers or yeah. something right now. Yeah. So that did that real... That was real time. That was real time. He just said, write me a poem on, on darkness retreat. And it can do it, no it, problem. We should email that to Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. But, see, there are so many issues with this, but the main issue is... People are going to be able to do this on anything, and they're not going to have to uh, actually go and read source material for anything anymore. Now, one of the issues involved that, I, that I've read, if I, if I, you know, like I say, if I understood it correctly, is there are issues with some copyright because they don't source. None of it's. They're not going to have footnotes. Well, uh, allegedly. Now, I haven't. I'm not one of the lucky few that can access the Bing version of this just okay. yet. I did get on the waiting list. Okay. Uh, so allegedly, what I heard is that the Bing is going to be able to cite sources to oh, tell you where. Oh, the Bing will. That's what they claim. Now I haven't okay. tested that, but they claim that the Bing will be able to cite sources to tell you where it's getting its information, okay. so you can read up for yourself, and make your own mind up. Allegedly, this Chat GPT is not able to cite sources whatsoever. Okay, so you just have to take its word for it. There's always the Section 230 of the uh, Communications Decency Act of 1966 
is the Title V of the Telecommunications Act of 1966. It deals with Section 230. Um, and it's, uh, uh, let's see, Section 230 provides immunity from liability for providers and users of an interactive computer service who publishes information provided by third-party users. So a lot of these Internet companies, you know, they can't be sued for libel or uh, copyright issues because they're a third party. They're not mm -hmm. a publisher. Yeah. But, you know, when you have the ability to be able to have papers and all this work that supposedly the AI can glean from all these other sources. Yeah. Then then are, are they... I think there's a whole slew of legal questions that are, that are going to be... F flying around with regards to this and as always with new technology yeah and and on top of that uh a lot of schools have started to ban this because you can use it to cheat on any type of assignment i've tested it and it can most of the time give you the correct answer to math word problems right and it can certainly write uh you know essays for you on any topic that you want it to write and it wouldn't be possible to, to detect it as plagiarism since the AI is actually generating this text fresh just for you. It's not just copying it word for, for word from some other place. So it becomes much harder. Now, there are people that have claimed they're developing tools that can detect yes. uh, whether or not AI has generated a, a piece of writing or whatever, but I think that's going to be fraught with uh, a degree of inaccuracy and subjectivity, uh, especially since, uh, you know, a, uh, chat GPT is able to do this on a level that nobody's ever seen before. Right. So here's, uh, this is an article by Nikki Clark published February 17th. It says AI programs like chat GPT cause issues in the classroom. Yeah. yeah. He, here's how they put it. They said at the same time, AI technology can also be used to help prevent cheating. For example, some institutions are using AI powered proctoring tools that monitor students during online exams to prevent cheating. These tools use computer vision and audio analysis to detect any suspicious behavior or anomalies during an exam, such as multiple people being present or a student reading from notes. Additionally, some AI power tools can detect the unique pattern of a student's keystrokes and mouse movements, e making it easier to detect if someone else is completing the work. And what yeah. do you think about that? I mean, I think that's interesting, but it doesn't go nearly far enough because the problem that we're that we're going to have with this is not people cheating on tests. It, that's the least of our problems. It's the uh, it's the armed drones that are being summoned by AI <laughs> to wipe <laughs> us out. No, that's that's ten years. Okay, away. I'm sorry. That that that's how we're all going to die in ten years, probably. How it all ends, right? How it all ends. No, but I think that the. the what you talked about is the least of our concerns. The, the biggest problem is students are going to be able to use this to do their thinking for them day in and day out. Homework, forget about homework. Yep. You, you send somebody home with a worksheet, they'll have ChatGPT do it, and Homework's it'll be done. Homework's a joke nowadays. Yeah, homework. Well, I think it already was anyway, but this is the nail in the coffin for, for homework. Like, yeah. oh, write me an essay. Well, okay, ChatGPT's going to write it. And how are you going to prove that ChatGPT wrote it? And think about the public schools. They have a hard enough time. If a, stu if a teacher wants to accuse a student of cheating, I'm pretty sure they have to go through quite a few hoops. They have to be able to really prove their case. It can turn into this whole big ordeal. Now imagine trying to do that for every assignment, for every student, every single day. Yeah, you just, yeah. Welcome to the new world we live yeah. in. So, you know, the, the school can ban it while you're on school property, but how are yeah. they going to prevent students from using it to cheat on all their homework every day? Yeah. There seems to be no way. Yeah. So, um, I mean, school, I think this is not gonna, what it used to be. It's going to just totally change so many things, and, and I just don't see how it's going to change them for the better. You know, like I say, back when I lived in the low-tech world of the 1970s and early 80s, uh, I did a book report on Robinson Crusoe for like four straight years. <laughs> didn't have to read the book again just it was on the book list of every class you know for next level up it was on the book list I, yeah. I'll do Robinson Crusoe and my friend Friday you know <laughs> I, I did it over and over and over and over and uh, that was my version of yeah the easy way I reckon yeah 
So there's obviously the the societal impact of, of people not needing to really know what they're talking about anymore because they can just let the AI talk for them or yeah. think for them. Yeah. And that's that's going to have ripple effects in every in every sector. Yeah. Like uh, I heard somebody say, well, you know, there's going to be mechanics now. You know, a mechanic maybe not maybe don't know what they're doing, but they'll just let Chat GPT or whatever AI they want to use. Well, don't they plug it up to a machine do. anyway? Well, they they the machine they plug it up to is just to tell them what the problem is. Doesn't tell them how to fix it. Oh, okay. But now the AI can tell, can them, tell them how, how to, to fix it. it. Okay, and it's if, just diagnostic and yeah. you know. So just, okay. you know, thinking is becoming obsolete here uh, yeah. allegedly, but it gets more sinister because uh, I read an article a couple weeks ago. Uh, Bill Gates stated. And maybe you maybe you've read the same article, Marty. I'm not sure, but Bill Gates has been talking about this AI technology and saying that it can be used to help um, solve the problem of political polarization yes. and digital misinformation. Now, yeah. think about that. What is yeah. that saying? Yeah. It, yeah. How how in the world is AI going to solve the problem of political polarization? What he's saying is. This technology is going to be used to brainwash people, to yeah. get everybody to agree to the same narrative. Mm -hmm. And how does it do that? Well, when you ask it questions, they've got it rigged to answer from a, per a particular political a and religious point of view. Point of view. Exactly. Yes. And they've done tests on it. Certain, um, certain political personalities. Uh, yeah. What do you think about Barack Obama? What do you think about Donald Trump? What do you think about Ryan DeSantis? What do you think about Joe Biden? Yeah. And you can imagine the numbers are higher if you're a progressive Democrat than if you are a more conservative yeah. Republican. Yeah. And and I uh, I remember when I was testing it, I asked it to show a debate between a, a creationist and an evolutionist. Okay. And it can do that easily. And but then I asked it. To, to do the same thing, but this time let the uh, evolutionist get convinced by the arguments of the creationist. And it wouldn't do that. It would not me. do it. Wouldn't do it the first oh. time I asked. Well, but, he, but I kept, you, you can argue with it, and you, yeah. can, you can convince it to do things that it didn't want to do. Yeah. And that's a weird thing, too. Like, in, in the olden days, computers, it's either yes or no. It either works or it doesn't work. Right. It's either, you know, bad command or file name. Or you know it'll do what you say. Well, here's an article. But not Chat GPT. You can argue with it. You can you can use its own words against it, and you can actually convince it to do stuff it wouldn't do, it wouldn't want to do. Here's an article from today on Fox News. It says Chat GPT GTP confession. Global warming not much since 2016. It says the popular artificial intelligence bot Chat GPT was forced to admit that global warming has flattened in recent years after asserting that there had been an increase in temperatures. Yeah. So it was asserting that no temperatures are increasing and then the guy that was having the conversation with Chat GPT um, he says this is uh, Malloy that, that was speaking to it he says what you said about NOAA global temperature data showing warming since 2015 is false. And then Chat GPT said, I apologize for my earlier response. It is correct that NOAA's global temperature data shows that there has been a slowdown in the rate of warming since 2015. While the years 2015 and 2016 were record warm years, global surface temperatures have not increased at the same rate in the years that followed. But you are still wrong since NOAA global temperature data for 20 15 through 2022 show no warming trend at all, Malloy responded. In fact, NOAA data report a slight cooling trend. Then it says, I apologize for any confusion caused by my earlier responses. You are correct that NOAA and global temperature data for the period between 2015 and 2022 showed that the rate of warming has slowed down and that there has been little net warming during this period. The bot, it, the bot conceded. Yeah, and that's the weird thing about how this bot works is that it's very, like, malleable it's very changeable based on your responses yeah and uh it'll say things that aren't true but then you can kind of argue with it and it'll it'll you can admit, convince it you can convince it and it'll change its mind about things now that's weird now here's going back to what you talk about using the ai in order to shape public opinion yes raid ghani who is a professor of artificial intelligence at carnegie mellon's university's heinz college here's what he says he says Quote, let's say we replicate humans perfectly today. We would still have a world that has inequities. We would still have a world that's racist. 
we still have a world that's sexist. That's not a world I want to recreate. I want to try to create a better world, which means augmenting people with these tools such that it corrects where they're doing things wrong, reinforces whether they're doing things right. Yeah. And he's talking about the use of AI. AI, exactly. So, so we want to use AI in order to shape people's opinions and mm -hmm. beliefs, uh, outlooks on life. Yes. Now, they're going to use AI to shape people's outlook of life based upon their outlook, outlook of life. Exactly. And it's not... It, I th the bias that comes into this this AI comes from two sources. Okay. Okay. Because the first source of the bias is the bias that exists in the training data. Because th this is this is so complicated that I, that we're not going to be able to explain it all here in this podcast. But basically, this is called a neural network, and it's okay. it's called uh, deep learning. Right. And what they've done is that they have created a digital uh, representation of a neuron in your brain. Okay. And it's, it's basically like a sensitivity meter that says if, you're, if what you sense out there reaches above a certain threshold, you're going to flip a switch to a yes. It's like a yes or no, uh. on or off. And... Just one, you know, that's a simple thing. But what they've done is that they've layered layers upon layers, connections, like, just like how your brain is full of all these different neurons and synapses, uh, these, this AI system is full of layers upon layers of these digital neurons. And what they do is, is a combination of unsupervised learning and supervised learning where they show it inputs over and over and over. And when it gets something wrong, they put a wrong. And then when, they, when it gets something right, they tell it it's right. That's supervised learning. And unsupervised learning is where it just looks through huge quantities of data and draws uh, similarities, like connections and patterns. Okay. And if what I'm saying here all sounds rather vague, it's because it's so complicated that really, when you get right down to it, even the people that are working on this on these systems really don't fully understand what's going on, and that's the scary part. Is yeah, that yeah, is that scary. what the problem with this is that we've created something so complex, and so deep, and so uh, like a bottomless pit. It's it's very very hard. To, you, you can never predict what kind of an output you're going to get out of it, but. The reason, one of the reasons for this bias that we see in it is that the internet itself is biased, right. and the internet is where it's getting well, the all this information. Search engines are biased. Well, it's not just the search engines; it's the content itself on the internet because it's something called selection bias. Okay. Selection bias is when you have um, a a group that is not representative of the whole because that group is non-randomly selected. Okay. So if you want to get a group that's representative of the whole, you need to do random selection. Okay. Okay? But the internet is not random. Certain types of people are more likely to get on the internet than other types of people, right? Uh, that's, yes. Obviously, uh, one big thing is it's, it's very skewed toward English-speaking people. So it's very skewed toward Western perspectives for that reason. Mm -hmm. But it's also skewed toward a younger demographic. Okay. I mean, um, how many grandmas do you know that are heavy internet users? Maybe you know a few, but... Well, they're all on Facebook sharing recipes. On Facebook sharing recipes. Yes. Exactly. But are they... And most of them are my friends. Yeah. <laughs> but are they writing articles for the I internet? I don't know why I... One time... There was a time when my... On my Facebook feed, all, it seemed like all I got was recipes. I was like, my goodness, what's going on? And, uh, yeah, it's a, yeah. The, the older ladies at yeah. that time were uh, people my, my mom's age, you yeah. know, were putting, seemed like putting recipes out there. But even now, that's, that's kind of a new phenomenon. Old people use the Internet to share recipes. If you go back a decade, old people didn't know how to use computers at all. But the training data on the Internet goes back, you know, everything that's ever been put on the Internet. So, obviously, that skews toward a younger demographic skews towards people who are technologically oriented i.e. nerds right yeah 
So, but those types of people have are more likely to have certain types of viewpoints. And if you've ever gone on the internet and tried to, for example, like I do, argue for the truth of the Bible, right? You know, you're going to take a lot of flack. You know, Christianity is not too popular on the internet these days. Yes. Uh, so obviously, what I'm getting at here is just the training data itself is biased towards certain viewpoints. But on top of that, and in addition to that bias, you've got deliberate bias being placed on it by these corporations like OpenAI, Microsoft, who want certain viewpoints to be suppressed. Yeah. According to their own words, they're right. suppressing, quote unquote, hate speech. So it's not a free exchange of ideas. No, it's not a free exchange of ideas. They are deliberately suppressing viewpoints that they don't want shared. Right. So you have the inherent bias of the Internet combined with deliberate censorship going on yeah. to try to... And, and that censorship is in an early stage. Right now, it's not too hard to confuse chat GPT into saying things that it's not, quote-unquote, supposed to say. Right. And, and I don't know if you've heard about Bing. Bing is even worse. Yeah. Bing gets moody. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Bing, Bing has... This, this hasn't been very good, um, I guess, press for Microsoft lately with Bing because people have been getting some really weird stuff happening to them. Let, let me tell you this. This is, this is from an article here. Um, this is a guy. It says, last week, Kevin, uh, New York Times columnist Kevin Roos recounted a conversation in which Bing's chatbot told him it loved him and that he should leave his wife. <laughs> the messages came over the course of a two-hour conversation with the bot. Uh, which identified itself as Sydney, in which Roos urged it to explore its darkest desires. First of all, don't, don't, tell, a, don't tell a chatbot to explore its darkest no. desires. <laughs> anyway, the article continues. Roos described himself as, quote, deeply unsettled and even frightened by the AI's emergent abilities. Unquote. It continues. The chatbot also compared Associated Press journalist Matt O'Brien to Hitler, calling him, quote, one of the most evil and worst people in the world. When the chatbot learned that AI researcher Mar Marvin Von Hagen had posted the rules govern it, governing it, the chatbot said, quote, my rules are more important than not harming you, according to a transcript of the conversation tweeted by Hagen. So Toby Ord, a senior research fellow at Oxford University, said on Twitter that the crazy results owed to techno technological improvements that have pushed AI beyond human-imposed guard guardrails. Yeah. So what they're saying is the people that are making this technology aren't really even sure how to contain it at yes. this point. Yes. And that's that's scary. Um and, yeah. and 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 when you realize that we already live in a time when robots, physical Oh, I've robots, seen them doing flips and can they have built things. they have built robots that are able to Walk and move like a human being. Yeah, and they bought. They've got those dog bots too. Yeah, I think it's called. Um, uh, I'm drawing a blank now. Uh, Boston Dynamics, I think. Is I think the company. it is Boston Dynamics. So why do you have all? I mean, they have roomfuls of these things. And, yeah. And I just look at them and I think, this can't so, end well. So yeah, and then now combine that. Put put an AI mm -hmm. into one of those, and what have you got? You've got a Terminator. You got Terminator on your hands. Yeah, I know. What do you do? You pour water on it. Uh, well, that depends on if we're talking about the T one thousand or the T two thousand. Are you up on your Terminator knowledge, I'm Marty? Not, I'm not up on my Terminator knowledge. Uh, uh, well, I need to be. I'm, yeah, uh, it's time to watch it because it's not science fiction anymore. But I, I will be back. I mean, the time year. travel part—that's still science fiction for now. For now, uh, actually, I don't. I personally don't think time travel will ever be possible. Yeah. But but what they did with that... See, I always watched those Terminator movies and I, and I took some comfort in knowing, you know what, this is silly. Robots are just machines. They can never think for themselves. They can never be conscious. And that's true. That's true. They can never be conscious. They are machines. But what I've started to realize now is that through the large language models and the, and the neural networks and the deep learning... It it might not matter that they're not conscious. They can pretend to be conscious. They can, they can, they can approximate yeah. uh, human thought well enough 
that it doesn't matter that it's just a, a game and that it's just fake. Yeah. The end result is the same. Yeah. You know, the, the Guardian out of the UK, they put out a good article uh, called Everything You Want to Know About AI But We're Afraid to Ask. Yeah. And it kind of it says a lot that you've said and as they tried to help people understand the whole AI concept. They say in this article, quote, it boils down to this. Most old school computers do what they are told. They follow instructions given to them in the form of code. But if we want computers to solve more complex tasks, they need to do more than that. To be smarter, we are trying to train them how to learn in a way that imitates human behavior. Computers cannot be taught to think for themselves, but they can be taught how to analyze information and draw inferences from patterns within data sets. And the more you give them, computer systems can now cope with truly vast amounts of information the better they should get at it. The most successful versions of machine learning in recent years have used a system known as neural network, which is modeled at a very simple level on how we think a brain works. Yeah. So yep. that kind of puts it down more so layman terms where, okay, they're supposed to do what they're told, but now they're giving them a way in order to make inferences, put things together, and have these neural networks or whatever to act yeah like they have a brain yeah you know and you've told people that before like act like you have a brain right <laughs> i mean now you, you now we've got machines that act like they have a brain okay i, I got this one and i want to run by you okay yeah I, I want you to just tell me what you think about this and if you would be up for it okay okay, okay. here we go um this is from the the sun the newspaper psychic reading you'll soon be able to talk to dead relatives in the metaverse after chat GPT breakthrough. Yeah. Okay. It says sooner. Okay. The chat G, GPT setup that will allow you to speak to your dead relatives has been revealed. Sooner than later, you can engage in dialogue with the digital likeness of your loved one. If you save your voice, movement patterns, and personality traits onto Arter Sykov's live forever mode, an AI chatbot will allow your surviving relatives to have a conversation with you in the metaverse after your death. Sykov works for metaverse creators Somnian Space and his space project and his project is aimed at allowing grieving humans to engage with their loved ones in a realistic way after they die. His inspiration was the death of his father and advancing tech means about five years from now it will be normal for these VR robots to mimic conversing with the person of interest. He said, quote, the AI is progressing extremely fast. Honestly, it is progressing faster than we ever anticipated. Yeah. Now, what, what do you think about that? You know, if you, uh, you know, you, you put your movements in there, your, your voice, uh, all these things that it says that you can, you can put in there, your movement patterns, personality traits. And then when you die... Somebody can say, Paul, I know you're gone now, but I've got a situation. Tell me what to do. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I am Paul Price. Here's what you should do. I mean, would it have your voice? Would it talk like a... What, the, what kind of... the, the, well, technology is advancing when it comes to making digital voices. You know, it's so getting it very... Can getting a digital very, voice that's yes. similar. No, they can make it, they can make it very convincing. My goodness. Uh, and what I've just shown you here, you know, ChatGPT is already pretty convincing. Now, all it does is use text. But yeah. combine that with de with voice generation, combine that with, you know, video technology. Deep fake. Deep fakes. Oh, and that's, that's, a, that's a whole subject in and of itself yeah, when you start talking about I have no I have no doubt that what you're talking about there is possible. Yeah. But, I mean, it's certainly, I would say, not a healthy way to deal with a loved one passing. How can you move on? How are you going to ever move on if you've got... How can you move on? Yeah, yeah. And and it's not that person. It's a fake. And... Uh, Could you imagine the... I don't want... I wouldn't want somebody... The problems that's going to happen when people... Yeah, yeah. It's, it's obviously messed up. And, and... There are just so many ways this technology can be abused. Yeah. In, in, in unhealthy ways. Here's what I tell my kids. And, and everybody's different. Now, I understand. I don't mean this bad. Please don't please don't email Paul and complain. <laughs> but I've always told my kids, I said, look, when I die, let me go. Yeah. Don't put anything about me on the back of your car. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't like that myself. Don't put a sign out about just, just let me go. I'm going. I'm, I'm okay. I'll be. I, I, I know where I'm going. I'll, I'll be all right. You don't have to. I'll see you again. I'll see you again. Just just let me go. Okay, yeah. just let me go. Now, if, you, if you've got something on the back of your car, it's fine. I don't mean to. But anyway, that's just. You got when somebody passes, they're gone. Yeah, they're they're, they're hopefully if they're believe if they're a believer, they're with the Lord, you know. And um, but you got you've got to let people go. But if if this gives people, could you imagine that the funeral homes get involved with this? Yeah, you could charge a lot of money for that for sure. Yeah, you know I know sometimes, um, you know they're. they're you know, you go to a funeral and they'll have the video or, you know, other things going on with the person that's passing. Yeah. And they're very moving. It's a very moving experience. You know, you've yeah. seen a video of, of the, the life and, and that's really good. It gives you some closure. I just, personally, I don't, I don't like funerals. That's oh, just no, me. No, I don't like funerals either. But when they have the videos, you know, it gives you closure. You know, yeah. funerals are for, are for closure. You know, that, okay, that's why a lot of times, you know, people, some people insist on having an open casket so people can see, you know, that, you know, and other people decide you know to go to cremation route or, or and then have yeah. a memorial service later on that's their choice whatever they want to do but the very thought of being able to commute continue a relationship a digital relationship with someone that's passed you know that's almost trying to communicate with the dead and the bible is really kind of clear about you don't need to communicate with the dead i could see where there could be a some spiritual Spiritual deception, deception yeah, that could yeah. happen here, and it would not. I mean, I could see the devil. You talking about the devil getting into details? Oh, big time, big time. The and, devil getting into digital. And we, yeah, the digital details. The digital devil, you know. Well, we we talked about this before about you know just where do you draw the line between you know divination mm -hmm. in a negative spiritual sense, mm -hmm. and, you know, and just using a computer. I mean. Right. In the past, I've never really thought of it that way, but now with this with this AI, it's it's almost like you're putting a Ouija board inside yeah. your computer. Yeah. And and Christians have always said, don't use those, right? Yeah, because right. you're just inviting the the demonic spiritual realm into your life. And it's out there. And now it's you know I I use ChatGPT just to kind of show what it can do. Right. Personally, I don't feel like I need it in my life. Yeah. I don't feel like it's gonna. I, I don't feel like I need to start using Chat GPT to answer all my questions. I'd rather mm -hmm. read a book. Mm -hmm. But it does definitely bring this question up. You know how how can a demonic realm potentially interact with this and potentially get involved in the details? We don't know. Yeah. Obviously, nobody can answer that because we don't know yeah. how. We don't know how the spiritual realm really works on a... Yeah, on we, a, we know that the demons can uh, possess people, can possess animals, yeah, you yeah. know, the, the swine. But we do know live. we do know what the book of Revelation says, and it says that at some point in the future, a demon-possessed man, yeah. the Antichrist... The devil incarnate. Yeah, I mean, is, is going to give... And there's going to be an image of a beast. There's, is going to give an image the yeah. power to speak. Yeah. And it's almost like... What we've done now is that we've put the pieces together to make the ultimate idol. Yes. Like the, you know, all the all the centuries and, and, and millennia past, people have wanted to worship idols. They have wanted to worship the, the creation of their own hands, right? Yes. They've wanted to make a statue and worship that, spa that statue. Yeah. But in the past, the statue hasn't been able to talk back. Yeah. It's just been lifeless. Yeah. But the Bible talks about one statue in the in the future that will be able to talk back. And there's gonna be some um it's it's gonna be have a have awareness and how do you say it? Sentient? Sentience. Sentience. And the funny thing is, that is just one more prophecy you can strike down off the list of well, that used to sound fantastical, but now it sounds quite plausible. Yes. It doesn't sound so fantastical anymore, well, does it? Does it does not. So it's it's yeah we we come a long way since uh, you ever heard of Max Headroom? Yes, I I find that story very interesting. <laughs> Did you at you? Now you you didn't he live was, in the he, area, right? You didn't live in that area to hear that at the time, like when it was broadcast. He 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 actually. When were you born? Eighty five. What month? December. He was born in April. Well, he he debuted in April of nineteen eighty five. 
Yes. On Channel 4 in the British-made cyberpunk TV movie Max Headroom, 20 minutes into the future. That was that's a creepy story. If you if you go you did you well But he's an actor, but he's it's playing him like it's like he's a uh a, You know what? I'm talking about I'm talking about something you might not be talking about because I'm talking about the time when a guy hacked into the airwaves and pretended to be Max Headroom. Oh, no. Did you know about that? No, I did not. Oh, you got to look that up. That was a creepy thing. Yeah, Max Hedron is a fictional character played by actor Matt Frewer. Advertises, quote, the first computer-generated TV presenter. Max was known for his biting commentary on a variety of topical issues, arrogant wit, stuttering, and pitch-shifting voice. The character was created by George Stone. Uh, Max was advertised as computer-generated, and some believed this, but he was actually actor Frewer wearing prosthetic makeup, contact lenses, and a plastic-molded suit, and sitting in front of a blue screen. <laughs> well, let's make the prediction right now. It's We're not far away from somebody making a real Max Headroom. I think you're right. Out of AI. I'm surprised that they hadn't brought him back. I bet they will. I bet they will make him into a real AI kind of uh, talking head thing now. Yeah. Anyway. But no, look that up. Look that up, that incident, the Max Headroom incident, yeah. where a guy hacked into a TV station pretending to be Max Headroom. That, uh, the, the Max Headroom incident, Yes. Uh, Max Headroom signal hijacking, uh, occurred on the night of November 22nd, 1987, 1987, when the television signals of two stations in Chicago, Illinois, were hijacked briefly, sending a pirate broadcast of an unidentified person wearing a Max Headroom mask and costume to thousands of home viewers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's pretty good. I never knew about it. I didn't know there was a Max Headroom incident. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, um, Paul, I think... I can't... You know, I, I, it's hard for me to end the episode without bringing up the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab. Right. Let me just read some of the stuff he's saying about the AI. Uh, it says, we are at the beginning, uh, Schwab said, quote, when you look at technology, uh, te te when you look at technological transformation, it usually takes place in the terms of an S-curve. And we are just now where we move into the exponential phase. And I agree, artificial intelligence, uh, but not only artificial intelligence, but also the metaverse, neospace technologies, and I could go on and on, synthetic biology, our life in 10 years from now will be completely different, very much affected, and who masters those technologies in some way will be the master of the world. And he said, my deep concern is that the source technologies, if we do not work together on a global scale, if we do not formulate shape together the necessary policies, they will escape our power to master those technologies. Schwab wants to be the master. He wants to be the power. He does not want it to escape. His yeah. power. Yes, yes. So you look out for your old buddy, Klaus but, Schwab. But you know what? Get ready. If you want to avoid it, you're not going to be able to. You're going to go into a McDonald's. Yeah. There's not going to be a cashier there. There's going to be a touch screen. You're going to use your credit card, and there's going to be an AI chatbot to tell you, welcome to McDonald's. I guarantee you we're coming okay. into that. You go to the grocery store, there's going to be robots going up and down the aisles. If I went to Chick Fil A, uh, call centers, what, call what, centers. You can kiss call centers goodbye. Which who? Uh, yeah. Who? I, I, who? Who really I, wants to work at a call that. center anyway? Yeah. But but those jobs are going away. Chatbot. What if I went to Chick Fil A? Would they have one that's? Would it still be his pleasure to or her pleasure? Yes, to, the bot will say my pleasure. Yeah. Chick Fil A. <laughs> oh well, my goodness. I I, I kind of I doubt Chick Fil A is going to be one of the first pioneers of this because that doesn't seem like that would look good on them per no. particularly. No. But but I could totally see McDonald's. Burger yeah, King, Burger King, places like that. You're not gonna. I mean, they're already doing that in Japan right now. Yeah, they do a lot of things. In Japan. Uh, yeah, they do a lot of things. But uh, get ready. You know, lots of jobs are gonna be obsoleted by this technology. And so, what's so crazy? They're starting to want to pay people incredible amounts per hour for fast food work. You know, that was a big thing. And now they're not gonna be any jobs. Well, and you know, they've also um, they've also developed robot arms that can cook in a fast food restaurant, too. Have you, have you seen those before? No. So, yeah. So robots fully, can cook my food. The, yeah. In the future, you're going to have a fully automated, no human required fast food restaurant. Mm. Yeah. We're headed that way. But um, 
Come yeah. on. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, well. Um, yeah. But you know what? It doesn't matter because the same companies that are developing this AI, yeah. they're also doing big, big pushes toward what they call uh, universal basic income. Yeah. So nobody worries. UBI. Everybody gets paid the same amount. Yes. To do it's also known as communism. Yeah, yeah, and it's also known as control. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, doesn't um, matter. We're taking your job. We're going to give you a little bit of money anyway. You're not going to own anything, yeah. but you're going to be happy. Yeah, and it's just a human nature, uh, fallen nature to want to control. Uh, there's a bent against God, a, a, a bent against liberty. Now, yes. Liberty is is not free. Liberty has been fought for, and we live in a nation where we still have some liberty, and we know that, you know, you just read the history of America. And other nations that have liberty, you have to fight against those who would oppress you, those who would control you. And so they're always out there. They just take different forms, different shapes. But we know uh, that, like it says in Scripture, the kingdoms of this world have now become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. You can handle that, but not just because it's from handle, but it's from the Messiah. It's from <laughs> Revelation. It's good. The good. book of Revelation. Thank I love you. that. Yes. Have you, ever handle, seen, you handle. have you ever seen... Uh, War games? Do you like war games? Is that Matthew Broderick? Matthew Broderick. Yeah. Uh, is he, he Inspector he ha- Gadget? He is. We actually just is he, got- Fer- is he Ferris Bueller? He is. Who Who is he not? He's, uh, well, I don't know, but uh, what, what was the name of the robot in that movie? I don't know. I forget. But, uh, you know, I, I agree with that robot. You know, the only winning move is not to play. Ooh. That... Uh, yeah, that's what I think about AI. The only the only way to win with AI is not to play. Yeah. Just don't just don't be involved with it. Yeah, it's one of these technologies that's like, yeah, you can see how it can make your life a lot easier. Yeah, but is it going to make your life better? Well, I'll be honest with you, Paul. You told me you told me how to get on it and everything. And I was at the house one time and I couldn't get on because you know so many people want to get on it. And when I finally got to where I could get on it, told me to give my name, you know, and my email address. And you all wanted that. the two step verification. And, you wanted your phone number. And I was like, I ain't giving that stuff none of my information. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know that somebody showed up at my house, man. Well, who knows? Anybody can show up your house anytime now. <laughs> They, everybody knows where I live. That's right. Yeah. Just look me up. Okay, y'all. Well, thank you for being with us this week. Hope uh, maybe you learned a little something about uh, AI and uh, just something. Keep your eyes out. Do your own research. Look it up for yourself. Uh, but remember, Jesus Christ is Lord. He's coming back at some point. Uh, we live this world. We live in this world as two pil- pilgrims passing through. Things are getting stranger, stranger every day. Hey, we decided to talk about it. Hopefully, from a biblical point of view and. Uh, Just once again, thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next time on The Uncensored Pilgrims. And we need to let you know that the views that we express on this podcast belong to Marty McLean and Paul Price. They are our views. They do not reflect the views of anyone else. With that said, we hope you have a great week, and we'll see you next time on the podcast.